chronic inflammation. So it basically starts a process that can't be reversed until you specifically do a number of things, which is described in the book. But as the inflammation proceeds, the levels of vitamin C drop lower and lower, more deeply inside the arterial wall until you finally have an arterial wall that's almost completely devoid of vitamin C. And this is important because the thing that vitamin C is absolutely essential for, in addition to many other things, is the ability to make the supportive structure called collagen. Collagen is a structural protein that gives you tensile strength to different uh, organs in the body, and one of them is the blood vessel wall. So as you become completely deficient in vitamin C in the blood vessel wall, you lose most of the supportive collagen structure, and then you have now a very weak vessel wall that if you do not do something else, it'll just expand like an aneurysm and rupture because it just can't buffer itself against the large arterial pressure that everybody has. And this is where the compensatory mechanism really kicks in because the body always tries to compensate even if you don't give it the things it needs to compensate. So it would like to compensate with vitamin C, None is available, so what else does it try to do? It actually starts building up the thickness of the atherosclerotic plaque in an attempt to make the blood vessel wall stronger because of the collagen that's no longer present. And that, in a nutshell, uh, uh, is, uh, is the process of heart disease and why vitamin C is so intimately involved in it. The fact that this is not known to most doctors in cardiology, you would think it would be urgent medical news. Tell me why, though, the cholesterol has been the villain and why the new knowledge is not seeping in when you have the evidence for it. In other words, what is cholesterol then and why is it still the villain? Well, cholesterol is one of many different what's called risk factors for coronary artery disease, and it is a legitimate risk factor. Uh, the higher your cholesterol levels are chronically, the more rapidly you're going to build up these plaques. So it definitely plays a role uh, in building plaque up. And when you're able to deplete cholesterol way down, you can actually get, uh, in animal studies, regression, a reversal of plaque. But what it does not address <clears throat> is the initial causative factor, which is to say cholesterol will not have any effect on causing coronary artery disease unless and until there's the vitamin C deficiency in the arterial wall to allow it to have its effect. And this was one of the main things that Stop America's number one killer that, that sort of shook out as I reviewed the literature is that basically all of the most prominent coronary artery disease risk factors were incapable of having their negative effect uh, in causing coronary artery disease uh, until there was clearly a vitamin C deficiency in their arterial wall. So if you will, the vitamin C was the final common denominator. Now, <clears throat> the danger that comes in particularly with cholesterol is there's certainly nothing wrong with trying to keep your atherosclerosis at bay and keep it from progressing rapidly by taking all these different uh, anti-cholesterol drugs, except that it does not address one extremely important thing. And that is, the higher your cholesterol levels go, the more this is an indication that you have a severe vitamin C deficiency in the body and if all you do is knock the cholesterol down, you can slow the heart disease, but in knocking the cholesterol down, guess what? Cholesterol is also a natural antioxidant, antitoxin type of preparation. And when you knock cholesterol levels down, you lose the body's natural protection against toxicity, and it's been very clear in the literature that the, the lower you drive your cholesterol down artificially with medicines, the greater your chance of cancer. 
So I didn't know that. I don't think most of the public knew that. That's fascinating. So uh, you're, again, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. You can reduce your chance of a heart attack while increasing your chance of cancer, and that's not a trade-off. I think most people uh, are willing to make if they know that they're making it. I want to ask you about the Oasis of Hope, which you brought up in your book. You talked about how they're using high doses of vitamin C as a protocol without chemo in treating cancer. It's being done. And I wondered if you could share a little bit about that. How are they doing and what's happening? Well, they've been doing this for some years now. Uh, They're doing it. Uh, There's Uh, a clinic in uh, Wichita, Kansas, that has been doing this work for quite a few years now. And when you (laughs) get rid of all your uh, medical political biases, it's really very straightforward. Uh, With just about any type of cancer, the more vitamin C you can take, the longer you'll live and the less bothersome symptomatology you'll have. Uh, And if you are able to use the proper delivery system and get the dose high enough and eliminate the things, this is important, that cause the vitamin C deficiency in the first place, which is more often than not dental, dental toxicity. So if you can increase the antioxidants and knock down the source of toxins, very, very, very many times you can get a complete resolution of the cancer. I mean, the mainstream never liked to use the word cure, so I just say, okay, you don't want to use the word cure, or let's just say if you do all these things, you can induce a permanent remission. I want to give an example of your work with Hal Huggins, particularly with root canals, that there are three miles of, is it capillaries? Capillary-sized dentin tubules. Okay, so there's three miles of these tubules with toxins that are multiplying, correct? Yes, ma'am. How come we don't know that? Seems like 101. Why doesn't the public, the consuming public, understand that when they're getting a root canal? Well, I tell you what, it's, it's sort of a touchy area, but it starts because a lot of people just believe that the true number one concern of dentists and doctors and other health care providers is the welfare of their patients. And I fought hard against not believing that, for a long time, but as I begin to see so many things rejected and not even intellectually processed and analyzed. In other words, a lot of docs and dentists operate by, you present them with a body of information and they know because they look at you and they know you're intelligent, they know intuitively you might have something, a point here their response is to, well, you know, it's not in the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm not even going to waste my time reading it. So they prevent themselves from even having the opportunity to assimilate the information. That's as best I can do. I mean, it's, it's again, something that we, we just don't want to deal with emotionally, intellectually, anything else. But, it, but the bottom line is doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, politicians, I don't care what the group is, none of them are inclined to do anything that's going to reduce their income, period. I can get that. I get the fear of changing the whole protocol and people getting well, scaring everybody in sight on the delivery side, right? Right. Why is the vitamin C a prime arterial protector? Because it gets rid of free radicals and decreases the oxidative stress? Is that the answer? That, that's it on the button. I okay. mean, the body is designed to operate optimally at a certain minimal amount of oxidative stress that's generated by normal oxidative processes, the processing of oxygen, the delivery of energy to different tissues. All of that will produce a small and limited amount of free radicals and oxidative stress, and then your body naturally processes that, neutralizes it with antioxidants, and the body just hums along like a well, well-tuned well watch. But when factors come to play that increase the amount of oxidative stress beyond a certain level, <clears throat> then everything starts to break down. And it usually breaks down depending on your unique genetic 
predisposition, which is why you could take 100 